Well, good evening, everybody. I'm really glad you guys all come out, learn a little bit about pinball, and of course, get a chance to play here once we get done with uh, the spiel, as they say. Got to get a drink of water. Hang on. Uh, I, the, reason, the reason I'm involved in it, my grandfather was an operator. He put these machines in the bars and the restaurants and the pizza shops and everywhere else. And uh, he started back in the 40s. I don't know a lot of, specifically about it before my time, but um, from what he told me and what I recall, he started out with one machine, one pinball machine. And that would have been uh, like a, a machine that would have been before flippers, pretty basic machine. And he kind of went on from there, and as he, as he progressed, and he took on a partner. And at one point in time, he told me they had over 300 machines, not just pinballs, but 300 machines, pinballs, jukeboxes, pool tables, the, uh, the puck bowling machines, 300 and some pieces in three different states all around here. And he had a, he had a storefront, of course, and he had trucks and employees and all that sort of thing. And um, I didn't come along until the mid-50s, so I really wasn't aware until the early 60s. And by that point in time, he had started to wind down and get smaller. And it was, he, I think he, him and his partner separated. And he was running out of his house at that point in time. But, uh, so I've been around these, these monsters all my life. And I've, I've really, really haven't always enjoyed them. Even more so than jukeboxes. Even though I'm really into music, the jukeboxes don't do much for me because, I mean, they play a record. They're nice to look at, but they just play a record. And every jukebox plays a record. With pinball, everyone's different. You play it differently. You approach it differently. So... I've always been a fan of these things, for sure. But um, as I said, they were just everywhere back in the 40s and 50s. Every place you looked, every gas station had a pinball machine, every bar, every pizza shop, uh, places like, like Kmart and um, all, the, all the different department stores. Between the double doors in that area where there were like vending machines and there were pinball machines and video games, too, all the time. Any way to make a buck. But um, just to kind of take you back the history of the games, way, way back pre-electric, almost pre-everything. They were very large, slanted tables, and they sat like, sometimes sat on legs, sometimes sat like on some kind of a larger table. And they just had like a, wooden, like a bunch of wooden balls and a large play field with pins and nails hit, pounded into the play field to make little scoring pockets and to divert the ball. And you had to shoot the ball with like, almost like a cue stick, like just shoot it with a stick. And there was nothing electric about it. They were completely, purely mechanical. And you shot five or ten balls, whatever the game was, and you added up your score in your head. And that was pretty much it. That's, that's the way pinball was back then. Um, as they learned to use electricity in the early 30s, they began to make smaller versions. Some of them sat on legs. Some of them still were countertop machines. And in the, like around 1932, 33, they began to work with electricity, figured out how to make things work with electricity. And that first game was called, um, what was that called? Contact in 1933. It had one electrically powered solenoid that kicked the ball. The ball fell into a pocket on the play field. It kicked it out and it rang a bell. Well, the first time that a player ever saw something like that, couldn't believe what they were hearing. They heard it, it threw the ball, it threw the ball back out. My goodness, look at that. And a bell rang, you know. Very, very basic, very simple thing, you know. And um, it just, it just, it went on from there. It just went on and on. Uh, the Gottlieb Company, which all three of those machines are made by the David Gottlieb Company, they, they pretty much, everything they ever made was pinball. Very rarely did they stray from pinball machines. Other companies like Bally and Williams, they would make out-and-out -out gambling machines that actually did pay out. They were called bingo games. They looked much like a pinball machine. They were shaped the same. They didn't have flippers, and they didn't have any way to move the ball. They just had rows of holes, almost like a gigantic bingo card. And you could change the odds somehow. I'm not even sure how that worked. And you, you would put a coin in and shoot five balls and try to make a line or a diagonal or a four square, something like that. And the game would pop up. It would pop up like maybe whatever, 20 or 30 or 50 games. Okay? So the bartender, whoever, would pay you back, give you the money for those games. And there was a switch underneath that they called a knockoff switch. And they would knock all those games off. That oh, definitely a gambling machine, no doubt about it. So there was a lot of problems with... Um, Pinball machines being thought of as gambling machines. Local governments, many governments, even in Chicago where they were built, pinball was outlawed. You could build them there, you could ship them, but you could not play a pinball machine legally in Chicago and even in New York City for the longest time. But um, getting back to the first, the first game that was electric, the, fir the person that designed that, his name was Harry Williams. He went on to, to come up with the Williams Pinball Manufacturing Company, which is still in business today. They bought out Bally and some other manufacturers, and they make, bingo, they make gambling machines for Las Vegas, and they still make pinball machines, too. So Harry has a rich history in the, in, the, uh, in the manufacturing business, as does David Gottlieb. 
and the fellow that made uh, that started Bally, his name was Ray Maloney. He started out distributing Gottlieb machines. He was the distributor. You'd go buy your games from him, put them in your locations. The Gottlieb game baffle ball was so popular, he couldn't get enough of the Gottlieb games to sell on his own. So Ray Maloney, being the inventor type he was, he decided he's going to build his own games. So his first game, he called it Ballyhoo, and it was a huge success. He sold 50,000 machines in seven months. He, he, he was off and running. So he called his, his company was called Lion Manufacturing Company. First game was called Ballyhoo. In a couple years, he changed the name to Bally. And that's been the name of that company ever since, until Williams bought it out. There were many, many other manufacturers. There was, there was Williams, there was Bally, there was Gottlieb, there was Chicago Coin. Uh, and a lot of companies, small and large, they came and went very quickly. Um, Exhibit Supply, United, there was a company called Stoner. Even the jukebox manufacturer, Rockola, they built pinball machines for a while there, and they got out of that after a while, too. That's just to name a few. There were literally dozens and dozens of manufacturers making pinballs in this country. Some only lasted a few months, and some, like, like Gottlieb, like Bally, went on for a long time. Oddly enough, most, most of the manufacturers, even today, were located in the greater Chicago area, mostly all of them. And I think the reason was there was so much industry in Chicago. Everything that they needed to build their games was in Chicago. They, they had woodworking shops for the cabinets. They had wire manufacturers, electrical parts, the solenoids, the switch blades, the relays, which could all be manufactured right there in Chicago. Uh, motors, uh, metal shops to make all the metal parts. Metal plating, plastic molding, all this sort of, and of course the graphics for the games. All that stuff was right there in Chicago, and that's kind of where they all gravitated to. Middle of the country, not too bad to ship either direction, you know. And uh, today, the two major manufacturers, Stern and Jersey Jack Pinball, are still located in the greater Chicago area. They still build games there today. Yeah, it's crazy. So um, when World War II came, there were no new pinball machines, of course. All, all the money and all the product went to the war effort. They were allowed to produce what they called conversion games. They would take an old pin, the, old, the older cabinet, make a new play field with new art, make a new, make a new little back glass, and then drop those in there and, and give it a whole new name. And they were allowed to do that through the war. So there were some war, what they call wartime conversion games. And a lot of them had to do with war themes and things like that. A lot of politically incorrect titles, <laughs> of course, back then, you know, but uh, that's just the way things were. Um, by the time World War II ended, all the manufacturers really, really got back to business, and the inventions and the innovations just came like crazy. Uh, they were all working to kind of outdo each other and, and make as much money as they could. In 1947, probably the single biggest invention for a pinball machine, Harry Mabs, who worked for the Gottlieb Company, invented the flipper. The first way, the first time you could ever control that ball and get that ball to go back up the play field somehow. Before that, even though they were electric, you just, you nudged the game or you plunged the ball a certain way and you nudged the game to get the ball to bounce around. Harry Mads came up with a flipper and his first game, it's up here somewhere, it's called Humpty Dumpty and they put six flippers on that game. The flippers were kind of crude, they weren't real strong, so it, really, it took six flippers to get that ball to sometimes get to the top of the play field. Um, oddly enough, as revolutionary as that game is and was, it doesn't command that much money today, even though it's old, because it's just not much fun. It's just not a very fun game, you know, but, it, but it's cool. It's a cool machine, you know. And, um, yeah, so after that, that, that every, everybody just took off. Even the manufacturers that had games without flippers were now selling retro flipper kits. You could buy that, a retro kit from the manufacturer. They showed you how to put them in, where to put them, put the buttons on the side of the cabinet so you could retro your older games. But in very short order, the older games were like yesterday's news. Nobody wanted them, nobody wanted to play them. You're gonna play a game and you're gonna nudge or you're gonna play a game you can push the buttons and flip the ball and make it fly around. Obviously, you know, you're gonna, you're gonna play the newer games. Um, again, like I said, pinball was illegal in some states. The idea there was they lumped them into gambling machines and even, even winning a free game, you know how if you get a high score, you win a free game or if you match at the end of the ball. A lot of the laws considered that free game, they deemed it of value, which meant the game was a gambling machine. Even though it had flippers, even though it was skill, if you won a game, the laws considered that that game had value and that was, now that machine was gambling and you couldn't use it. You couldn't play it anywhere. Chicago was like that, parts of Wisconsin were like that, and parts of New York State were like that too. So 
Alvin Gottlieb, the son of David Gottlieb, the pinball manufacturer, he came up with an idea, took it to his dad, where instead of winning a game, if you had a certain objective, you win an extra ball. So it counted an extra ball in the back class. And he called it Attaball. He coined the term Attaball. And dad liked it. David got, thought it was a good idea. It got around the gambling laws, so they began to produce Attaball machines. Now, Williams, not to be outdone, they came up with the same idea. They did it. They wanted to call their first Attaball pinball machine Attaball. And David Gottlieb said, nah, can't do that. That's our, that's our term. You, know, you can't do it. So a few of them come out. A few back classes come out with the term Attaball, but what they wound up calling it was Skill Ball. So those games continued in Chicago. I forget, it wasn't, it wasn't that late into the 60s in Chicago, but in New York City and New York State, pinball machines were still technically illegal until 1976, believe it or not. It's insane. A game of skill that you put a quarter in play it and enjoy yourself was, it was illegal to play. Now, I don't know that the laws were all that enforced all that well, but they were technically illegal. And you can see, you can find pictures online like back in the 40s of truckloads of games being smashed by the police with sledgehammers just being smashed to death. That's, that's the weird laws, but that's the way it was. Yeah, so Gottlieb made out of balls, Williams made out of balls, and they made those up until pinball was legal in 1976. But, um, Getting back to, like in the post-war era, Gottlieb was pretty much the Cadillac of manufacturers. They had, their, their build quality was very good. The stuff just worked day in and day out, which of course is important to a guy operating that game. He needs that game to work every day to make money, you know. They had great designs and they had great art. Um, one of their best designers, probably their best designer, Wayne Nyans, and you'll see his, there, there's Wayne right there. He, he helped design Spirit of 76. That was the last game he designed. But he designed Dragonette, and he helped design King of Diamonds, too. But overall, Wayne worked for Gottlieb up until, uh, when did Gottlieb sell out? Sometime in the 80s, and he finally retired. And he started in the 40s there. He designed almost 300 machines for Gottlieb. In other words, designed the playfield layout, okay? Wayne was probably, of the, of the 50s and 60s, probably the best designer there was. The cool part about this is Wayne is still alive and with us at 104 years old. He lives, in, he lives in the South, and two of my friends call him every so often to check on him, see how he's doing. He loves talking pinball. He'll talk your ear off about pinball and his favorite games and some of the innovations he did and all that sort of thing. But, uh, yeah, he, he's a peach. He's really something else. Uh, a later designer after Wayne was Ed Krinsky, and he was with Gottlieb for... 25 years, designed 300 and some games. Ed, Ed did a lot of good games. Ed had a lot of crazy things going on in his back class. He might have a, like you see the people on the glass, but in the corners, he always had like these little weird animals and things going on. Like, you're like, like what was he thinking when he did that? You know, it's just, it's crazy stuff. But um, the designers pretty much worked directly for the manufacturers. They worked in-house. The artists worked for a company called Ad Posters in Chicago, but the manufacturers would specify Certain artists, like he does our games. Nobody else does our games. Like, for instance, the, the one, the artist for Dragonette was Roy Parker. He did almost 300 games for Gottlieb. That's the only company he ever worked for was Gottlieb until he died in 1964. And he did about tons of games. And if you look at his art, it's very colorful and very interesting. He liked, he liked cartoon bubbles. You look on the back class. People like, like cartoons in the, in the uh, TV and the uh, newspapers. Little bubbles about people saying things. That game is a, is, an, is a takeoff of the old Dragnet radio program, not the TV program, the radio program. And they did a lot of that. They, they, I wouldn't say they ripped off um, titles, but they did a lot of things like that. Um, well, just to give you an idea, where's that at? Where's my notes here? Yeah, um, yeah that, that was the take, takeoff of the radio program, Dragonet. Williams, in 1964, did a pinball machine called Beat Time. You look at the game, it's obviously it's the Beatles, obviously. But the bass drum where it should say Beatles, it says the Bootles, B-O-O-T-L-E-S. So they got around that pretty good. Um, when John Glenn made his first space flight, they had a game called Friendship 7. You know, it had John Glenn's picture on there, you know. Um, the Little Abner comic, some of you may remember Little Abner. They made a machine called Daisy May. She was kind of like the center of attention in the Little Abner comics. And then, of course, they used themes like Bonanza from the TV show, the 1964 World Fair in New York City, they made a game called World Fair. And innovations came like crazy. Just, there were all kind of innovations in the game. Any way to attract people to that game to drop your nickel or your dime or your quarter, or whatever it was. 
Um, like for instance, on King of Diamonds, you'll see in the back glass, those red cards. As you hit objectives on the playfield, the cards come down into the glass. If you get all the cards, that lights your special on the playfield. And then you chase, you chase the ace, queen, king, jack, and the uh, ten, I guess, to get your free games. So animation and gimmicks to get you to play that game was very, very important. They always tried it. Every manufacturer did that, every one of them. Um, yeah, King of Diamonds has, like I said, the cards in the back, but it also has a horizontal roto target in the middle of the playfield, too. Gottlieb developed that around 1957, I guess. The first one was, was rotary this way. It was vertical. Then they flipped them over and made them horizontal. But uh, yeah, all, all the time gimmicks, all the time. And um, King of Diamonds was 10 cents a play, three for a quarter. That was built in 1967. Dragon Net was built in 54, and that was, that was a nickel a play. Five cents, you could play a five ball game. And then, of course, later on, far out, that's in the 70s, that was two plays for a quarter. And those were adjustable. You could adjust those games as they got older and the games weren't as popular. You could adjust the price down from like maybe two for a quarter to three for a quarter or from 10 cents to a nickel to try to get people to play them if you could, you know. But um, so around 1970, right around 1970, they switched from the smaller flipper. If you noticed on these games, two of them have the smaller two inch flippers. They flipped to the three-inch flippers all like on far out. That gave you a little more action, a little more ball control because you had more of a flipper to work with. And the games got faster, too. They got much faster in that era. But um, so they did that up until, I guess it was about 1976, 77. They began thinking about solid state technology using, using circuit boards and chips instead of all the relays and things like that. And I'm going to show you inside one of the games later on. We'll take a look. So around 1976, 77, they started digital. And by 77, the digital games were showing up. They were still making mechanical versions of the digital games because a lot of the foreign countries, uh, France and Germany, were really, really pushing against digital because they didn't know how to fix them. They had no idea what to do with a circuit board. These old guys that fixed these games knew what to do with a switch and a relay and soldering wires. So that for a while, they made dual runs. They had to make the game both ways for, to, to pretty much make everybody happy. But by 1979, the writing was pretty much on the wall. Nobody, nobody really wanted to play the older games anymore. You could put a digital machine and the, and the mechanical version side by side, the same game, and the digital game would make more money every time just because people thought it was better, it was newer, and all that. But um, yeah, and. Um, that's when Gottlieb, the manufacturer named Gottlieb, started to lose steam. They weren't, they weren't doing very well in the digital age. Bally picked it up, and they were doing licenses like Evil Knievel. They were doing like Harlem Globetrotters, Bobby Orr Power Play. And Bally, on, of course, there's a game called Eight Ball, which looks just like Fonzie on Happy Days. There's no doubt that it's Fonzie on there. But they didn't use the Happy Days logos or anything like that, so they got away with that. And I think they made 18,000 of just that one game. That's how popular it was. Sold it all over the world. Um, let's see what else. What did I forget? What did I forget here? I was going pretty fast. Yeah. Oh, I do want to show you some of the parts, some of the actual mechanical parts to the games. Um, and if it wasn't for, once they started to use electricity, they learned how to use what I call electromechanical and electro, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Magnetic. Electromag electromagnetism. What, it, what happens is, let me see if I can show you something here. There's a, this, this, little device, this little thing right here is a coil of wire, okay? Coiled around a spool. Now, when you electrify that wire, that wire turns into a magnet, and it'll pull this little plunger down, and when you apply power to the coil, it pulls the plunger, turns the reel. So that's how it works, just like that. Now, in a machine like that Gottlieb far out, there's about 60 of these coils in there. Some, some turn things, some activate small relays with stacks of switches like this. You've got a coil that pulls this armature down, and the armature opens and closes a bunch of switches, depending on, depending on what it has to do. So without electromagnetism, this wouldn't even be possible. And like the four relays are full of coils, and I don't want to say miles of wire, but an awful lot of wire in there, for sure, for sure. Um, this is a chime. A chime box that Gottlieb developed, really nice sounding chimes. Let's see if I can do this. Before that, they were just big round bells. They just had a big like gong sound to them. So all the games from like 1970 up had the chime box in them. 
Very pleasing sound. Here's some, um, you can come on and look at this stuff later on if you want to. Large, there's the larger flipper. There's the smaller flipper with the, with the, the shaft that goes down through. Yeah, so. And, um, oh yeah. This little gadget here, that's a coin rejector or a coin acceptor, whatever you want to say. When you drop your coin in the machine, the machine funnels the coin through this little gadget and then like one second, it checks the weight of the coin right there. It checks the thickness of the coin. It checks with a magnet to see if the coin is magnetic or not. And then it does a bounce test on the coin also to make sure the coin is the right density all that quickly. And if it comes out the proper side, it hits the coin switch and starts the machine up. And it's just, it's just literally this quick, just like that. It did four tests in that amount of time right there. Test the quarter. Now, if you try to put a slug in there, the magnet will grab it. If you put a Canadian coin in, it doesn't like Canadian coins either for some reason. They're a different size or whatever, and it'll spit it back. So, yeah, and these, these are in every machine, every one of them. Nickel, diamond, quarter mechanisms. Yeah. So, um, any questions? Anybody have any questions? Guys? Yes? Oh boy, my favorite game, one of my favorite games is definitely King of Diamonds. And another one, of course, is Dragonette. Dragonette is special to me because that game was built the month and year that I was born. That game was built in June of 1954. So it's coming up on 68 years old in a couple months. And I looked for that game for uh, 25 years, maybe 30 years, looking for a nice one, or, or actually any game. And oddly enough, I found that game 10 minutes from where we're sitting. I couldn't believe it. It was a mess. It was a mess. You know, there was no back glass. That's a new reproduction back glass. And there was, there was no front door and there were other things missing. But I had, like they say on American Pickers, I had the bones. I had the bones of the game, you know. And that's how it turned out. And it plays perfectly, 100%. Um, there's other 60s games I like a lot because Gottlieb was really good in the 60s with animations and just very, very, very good play quality. They, they just enticed you so much, get you gets you so close to winning a game or, or getting that match, and you're like, ah, put another dime in there. I know I can beat this thing. Yeah. You know what I'm talking about, right? Yeah. Been, you probably spent a lot of money somewhere, right? Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, yes? Uh, I see that the city of Pittsburgh certificate showing up on there. What was that for? And I, I didn't talk about that. Yeah. Those were licensed. You had to license the games. So, and you had to stick a license on every game every year. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I actually collect those old certificates. I, I've got some that go back into the early 50s and even late 40s. Yeah, pretty neat. Uh, yeah, Butler didn't have licensing until sometime in the, um, when was that? Sometime in the late 70s or early 80s, they began. Butler Township started to require licenses on the games, you know. And it wasn't much at first, but you know how that goes. It, it's always cheap at first, right? Then they just keep, they keep bumping it up. But uh, pinballs needed a license, jukeboxes needed a license, every, every mechanical coin-operated device you had to have a license on. Yeah, yeah. Something else I didn't mention though, the, a lot of the manufacturers, Williams and Bally especially, made more than just pinball machines. Bally, for instance, made like the, uh, remember the little horses you'd see outside of Murphy's, put a nickel in it and ride those? That was Bally that made those. Williams made bowling machines with a ball bowler, puck bowlers. Uh, remember the mechanical gun games where you stood up, you put a diamond and shot through the glass with the targets that went around? They made all that stuff. Gottlieb really didn't. Gottlieb pretty much stayed to pinball the whole time, and Gottlieb wanted nothing to do, nothing to do with gambling. He railed against gambling, he wanted nothing to do with it. He kind of wanted his business to be clean, you know. And David Gottlieb was very successful to the point that up in Chicago, I forget the name of the town, he donated an entire wing to a hospital just building pinball machines. That's the kind of money he made. And um, very successful, very successful. Just cranking them out like crazy. Um, Price-wise, I know Dragonette brand new back in 1954 would have been about $300 brand new to buy it. Um, even King of Diamonds in 1967 was 680 in the box. Brand new game, 680 bucks, and we got our money back on dimes and quarters. You know, it's crazy. But you didn't have video games. You didn't have home systems. You didn't have PlayStations. You had pinball machines and some bowlers maybe, you know. So when you went to play games, chances are you're going to play a pinball machine. That's before Space Invaders, before Pac-Man, before all that sort of stuff. That was the entertainment right there, you know. And like I said, and you all know, they were just everywhere. Everywhere you went, there were pinball machines. And um, 
I spent my younger years with my grandfather. Once I, once I was able to drive a car, I was the guy moving them from bar to bar to bar to bar and running to Pittsburgh for machines and picking up a new game or going down to get parts. Because you had to move them. You had to keep them moving in your different accounts because you didn't want people getting tired of playing that same machine. So every like two or three months, you're moving a game the whole way around your account. You buy a new game and everybody gets moved down one notch, you know. So it was just never ending. I mean, I just, I ran the wheels off so many vehicles doing that for him, you know. And uh, moving pool tables was no joy, I can tell you that. They were monstrous things. Uh, jukeboxes were bad enough. Pool, pinballs weren't bad, but uh, jukes and pool tables were just, oh my goodness, they were outrageous things to have to move. But that's what he did. That's what my grandfather did pretty much all his life. And my grandfather was on crutches from the time he was 16 years old. And when I was younger, I had no idea how he ran this business. I didn't, I didn't really get it at first, you know. But he had a lot of help. He had a lot of people working for him, working with him. I came along, and then I was, I was the guy. You know, I was the guy that did all that, ran around all the time. But uh, it was an interesting life. It's something most people don't really think about. You know, you go, into, you go into a place and play the machines. You don't think about the guy that put them in there or where did they come from or who made them. You just you put your money in and play them, you know. Um, one of the best parts for me was going to our distributor and seeing a truckload of new games coming in and taking them out of the box and getting it ready and putting it in your truck and heading home. You know, that was a blast. And that's something that people just would know. You, you, you can't know that, you know. All you know is you're playing a machine. There it is. You're playing a new game somewhere, you know. We had them in the Baltimore County Community College. Um, and, and out there, the kids really enjoyed the games, and we would always put the new games at the college first because they'd, they'd play the life out of them. You could get your money back pretty quick out there because, oh, yeah, they just they'd fire quarters and those things like crazy, you know. My brother went out there, and he, he would encourage his buddies to go play the pinball machines. <laughs> yeah. So, um, you know, I think that's probably all I got for you here. Um, any more questions? Anybody have any questions? Yeah. What's the value of the machines now? It really depends on, um, you're talking about these machines specifically? Um, far out, probably in the condition it's in, it, it's, I've, just, I've just rehabbed that game. That actually belongs to a friend of mine. And he, he yeah, thank you. He brought, it, he brought it up. He got it given to him. He had it 15 years, and he finally got around to fixing it. That is probably about a twelve to $1,500 game today, all done the way it sits. Yeah, all done. Yeah. Uh, it didn't cost that much new. You know, that, that far out probably cost about $1,100 new. But um, King of Diamonds, I remember specifically, was 680 bucks in the box. I remember that because that's the first game I can recall my grandfather specifically telling me, yeah, we just got that. That's brand new. Yeah. So uh, Dragonette, probably in the 50s, probably about $300, $350, maybe something like that. Uh, new ones today. My daughter just bought her first new machine. She has four now, by the way. She's crazy as me. She bought a brand new machine, and she paid $7,800. That's a deal. For one. It's a deal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you know what? It's what she wanted. And I said, hey, kid, do it. Go get it, you know. She loves it. It's from the Netflix TV show called Stranger Things. Most games, you know it? Yeah, okay. Most games, most all games today are licensed from a movie or a TV show, or something like that. These older games had very few licenses till the mid-70s. They just did whatever. They picked up on, like I said before, on themes, you know. Um, God love Man and Machine. You, maybe some of you older folks may remember Sonia Henney, the ice skater. Remember that name? They did a game called Ice Review. And there she was on the glass. I mean, her name was never mentioned, but there's no doubt who that was, you know. But they did that a lot. They really did. Yeah. Question? Yes, yes. You mentioned replacing Oh, Dragonette. Dragonette, that's a brand new back glass. The glass is a reproduction. So you had somebody painted that? No, it, it was produced. It was produced just like the old glasses were. There's, there's a guy, there's a company that does back glasses. Yeah. So they had their silk screens or whatever they would use. They had to make them. Yeah, the silk screens aren't, they're not, they're not around. The old ones aren't around anymore. Because from a manufacturing standpoint, you know, when Gottlieb made, let's say they made Dragonette, and they made 1,500 of them, well, that's it. We gotta move on to the next game. We don't have time to go back and do that. You know, they didn't want these games lasting this long. They didn't want these games around. They wanted you to buy the game as an operator, buy that game, make as much money as you can, use it up, wear it out, come get another one. 
You know, that was the idea. It's like, it's like buying a wrench. You use a wrench till it breaks, and you go buy another one. That's what these were, you know. It's amazing how many thousands and thousands of these games are around. I mean, I, I know people, I know friends that have over 100 games, you know. I, I know a couple guys that have more than that, you know. The, the back glasses were all silk screen? Silk screen, yeah, each, each individual color. Boy, that's a complicated bunch of silk screen. Yeah. Yeah, no, that, I, I will just tell you, I don't know what a glass cost back then, but that glass was $300 plus shipping just for that one. Uh, if you need one, it's a bargain. It's, it's an absolutely a bargain, yeah. And the kicker is he doesn't make every glass for every game. Um, he'll make the glass once he gets enough requests. If he gets at least 10 requests for a game, then he'll get a good example of the glass and make the silks and crank out the glasses. Yeah. So you can't get any, any glass you want at any time. Yes? Do you have the Beatles one? No, I really want to get one someday, though. Yeah. yeah. Because now... Now, with that reproduced back glass, does say the Beatles on it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I don't, think, I don't think it matters to anybody now. But they weren't allowed to do it back then, you know. But, yeah, the back glass now says the Beatles right on the glass. And it's obvious. It's obvious. Painfully obvious it's the Beatles. There's no doubt. You know, they got the mop top hair and they got the, the jackets without the collars and all that sort of thing, you know. Yeah. There's some political, politically correct stuff there. Incorrect, I should say. Yeah. I do. I take off the head. The head unbolts and unplugs, then take off the legs and use, use a regular dolly, regular two-wheeler. Yeah. Yeah. So how many games do you have? Too many. <laughs> no. Uh, I, guess there's, I guess there's 10 in my house right now. Wow. There's not that much room for 10, but they're in there. Yeah. It's, I, if I, they're kind of like, like rabbits, you know? The more space you have, the more you have of them, you know? It's crazy. I, I, I just I enjoy them so much. And I can never say no if the price is right. If it's an old game I really like, I'll find a place for it, you know. I mean, I, I can remember one year about 12 years ago, I left two in my van all winter because I had no place to put them. I left them in the back of the van until springtime, you know. There was just no place for them, you know. Yeah, that's a gauntlet with some animation. That's crossword. That's a good game. I had that game like five years ago. This little guy here, the, this guy shoots at him, and he couldn't see it, but his feet jump around when the guy with the gun shoots at him. The gun lights up, and his feet dance around a little bit. Yeah. But um, anybody else? Questions? No? Anything? Yeah. You said the uh, games cost like about $300 in the early, early 50s. Yeah, that Dragonette would have been about that, yeah. For perspective, a new Ford was about $1,000 at that time. Oh, okay. I didn't know that. Yeah. So, yeah. You know, they were not cheap. No, they weren't cheap. No, that's for sure. Yeah. But even like, you know, that was $300 was a lot of money in 54. And you got it back a nickel at a time, you know. Now, and you take the money that comes into that box, you split that with wherever the machine is. If it's in a gas station, he gets his cut and the operator gets his cut. So you got to make... Maybe not twice as much, but almost twice as much just to break even. You know, that's a lot of nickels. Yeah. Wear and, tear. and wear and tear and maintenance, yeah. Yeah, you gotta change bulb, you gotta change the rubber rings once in a while, you know. Yes. So what was the average lifespan of like a pinball machine? Because I'm assuming it was kind of like a consumable where you knew that until it was broken and then after it was too much money to fix, you just disposed Yeah, well the truth of the matter is the average usable lifespan was about three to five years. The game would still be okay to play, but nobody wanted to play it after five years because of progress, you know. Yeah. So a lot of games got relegated to an operator's warehouse and sat there for years and years and years, you know. Yeah, this one I found in a basement, and it had sat there for over 30 years, you know, just unused. Tore apart. The kids tore it all apart, you know. I mean, I bought, I literally bought a basement full of what I assumed were pieces and parts of games. He said, just make me an offer and get it out of here. we got to move, you know. I got two and a half Dodge Caravan loads full of pieces and parts, and I found out that I had a Dragonette and I couldn't believe them. I, I knew I had the play field because I knew the art, but the rest of it was there except for the glass, you know, and I thought, oh my goodness, the game I've been looking for for decades, you know. It's crazy, it's crazy. So would you like to look inside one? Why don't we do that? Let's do that, and if you have any questions along the way, please ask. Also, just for kicks, anybody wants a souvenir pinball to take home? There they are, you can have one. Scouts, you want to grab one of those? I'm not going to tell you what not to do with it or what to do with it. That's up to you, you know. <laughs> I'm not getting involved in that mess.
Let me get the keys here. We'll open this baby up. Front row, that's right. Be the first to get shocked. Excuse me, Lou. Thank you. Yeah, you'll have to kind of come up and gather around a little bit if you want to see inside. Yes. Yeah, one and one sixteenth. All it is is a ball bearing. That's all it is. Yeah, polished ball bearing. So anyway, whoop. this game has an innovation they call drop targets. They were invented around 1970. You hit the hit the target and they drop down. Every ball they reset again. So that was a big innovation. That uh, actually the Williams company came up with drop targets. Gottlieb came up with a bank of drop targets. Williams was using single targets for a long time. So we're going to look in the belly of the beast here. Take the glass off. I got to put this someplace safe. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Take the ball out and look inside the beast. You got a score motor. Lots and lots of relays. This gadget here counts the bonus points. See that little wiper gadget moving there? And this resets it whenever, you, whenever it counts the bonus down, that resets it back. These coils reset the drop targets when the targets fall. When you lose your ball, it scores a bonus and resets, resets the targets. Here's your flippers. Electromagnet and a plunger, soft metal plunger, and electricity. There you go. This gadget kicks the ball out to shoot the next ball. Yeah. Lots of wires, lots of switches. Crazy. And the back's just as bad. <laughs> 